In this video, we are going to develop the final difference method for a one-dimensional model boundary value problem. So let us discuss a broader perspective of how the final difference method is used. At the outset, we want to solve some boundary value problem, maybe a stationary heat equation, for example. The final difference method is a mathematical construction that in some sense replaces the original boundary value problem by a discrete boundary value problem. That discrete boundary value problem that we construct by the final difference method boils down at the end of the day to a linear system of equations, which of course we can solve with techniques from numerical linear algebra. And well, the solution to that linear system of equations is the solution to that discrete boundary value problem the solution to the fund difference method, so to say, that solution we use as an approximation to the solution of the original boundary value problem. That is a broad agenda of what we're going to do. We are going to develop that with a concrete example. Step zero. We introduce a model boundary value problem, namely the so-called Poisson equation. The one-dimensional Poisson equation is a differential equation over an interval from A to B. It is the second order differential equation where the unknown function u satisfies negative u prime prime of x equal f of x. More specifically, we are going to consider the Poisson equation with Dirichlet boundary conditions, which means that we fix the boundary values of the function at the left endpoint of the interval and the right endpoint of the interval. So we demand that u of a equals some number g a and u of b equals some number g b. The Poisson equation with Dirichlet boundary conditions is a boundary value problem and one can show that this boundary value problem has got a unique solution. In fact, the Poisson equation with Dirichlet boundary conditions is probably the most important boundary value problem in all of mathematics. Even though it looks very simple, it is the most important model problem in all of numerical analysis. I'd say that probably 90% of all research publications in numerical analysis are to some extent concerned with the Poisson equation. The reason is that the Poisson equation is fairly well understood. And as soon as you go even slightly more general, then you easily find yourself in uncharted territory. Let us contemplate for a moment why Dirichlet boundary conditions seem to be a natural choice of boundary conditions. Let's suppose I've got a solution U of the Poisson equation. If I add some linear function to that solution U, then this new function will again solve the differential equation of the Poisson problem because the second derivative of a linear function vanishes. So it seems intuitive that the solution cannot be unique until I, unless I make some additional requirements. In fact, since the linear functions are precisely those functions whose second derivative is zero, I only need to add two more conditions in order to make the solution unique, if the solution exists, of course. And one way of doing so is to set the boundary values of the function at the endpoints of the interval. And finally, let me also remark that this differential equation is also known as a diffusion equation, because with that simple second derivative equation, you can describe diffusive processes in physics, like for example, the diffusion of heat, the diffusion of water in the soil, the diffusion of chemicals in water, maybe the diffusion of bacteria and liquid. This is one of the most universal differential equations you're ever going to meet in mathematics. That all being said, we are here for a discretization of the differential equation. And the starting point for that is to introduce a discrete mesh over the interval from A to B, the interval of interest. Let n be a number greater than one, 
and let us define h as one over n plus one. We are going to partition the interval from a to b into n plus one subintervals. And each of those subintervals is going to have length h. The boundaries of the subintervals are nodal points within the interval. Let us define xk as a plus k times h. So we go k steps of size h starting at the left boundary of the interval. In this partition, the left end point a equals x0, the next point is x1, the next one is x2, up to x3, and so on. The difference between consecutive nodal points is always a step size h. Eventually, we come to xn minus 1, xn, and finally xn plus 1, which is the right end point of the interval called b. The nodal points x1, x2, up to xn are the interior nodal points of the interval. And x0 and xn plus 1 are the boundary nodes. We call the collection of these nodal points a discrete mesh, or just a mesh, or some people call it a grid. OK, so what is the point of this discrete mesh? The point of that discrete mesh is as follows, namely, we are going to approximate the solution u to the original boundary value problem at the point x0, x1, x2, up to xn plus 1. Just like we approximated the solution to an initial value problem at different points in time, at different time steps, we are going to approximate the solution of a boundary value problem at different points in space. In some sense, the discrete mesh defines a discrete geometry, so to speak. And on this discrete geometry, we develop a notion of what you might call discrete functions. However, much of this slide is mostly notation. It is not particularly deep, but establishing that notation is going to help us to to understand the find difference method, which will be complicated enough. So to begin with, we'll call that C of AB is a common notation for the vector space of continuous functions over the interval from A to B. Furthermore, let us define the vector space VH, where H is a step size, as R to the N plus two, where N is the number of interior nodes, just as in the previous slide. So that is just the Euclidean vector space of dimension n plus 2. Conceptually, this is going to be a vector space of discrete functions, which, of course, is a very ceremonial term for something very simple. We are going to index the entries of the vectors in Vh by V0, V1, V2, up to Vn minus 1, Vn, Vn plus 1. So if V is an element of VH, then the coordinates of V in some sense give us the values that we associate with the nodal points of the discrete mesh. It would also be helpful to establish a restriction operator. So we define the mapping RH as the linear mapping that goes from the space of continuous functions over AB into this vector space VH. This mapping can be described as follows. If V is a continuous function over AB, then the kth entry of RHV, the case in between 0 and n plus 1, is defined as V at the nodal point xk. So to put it into somewhat simpler terms, we take a function V that is continuous over AB, and then we sample that function over the nodal points x0, x1, x up to xn, xn plus 1, and these samples of function values of V are then put into a vector. That vector is RH of V. In fact, we are going to do that with the right-hand side of the boundary value problem. So we define FH as RH of F. In other words, we take the function F, we then we 
sample the values of f at x0, x1, up to xm plus 1, and put this into a vector which we call fh. Again, this is just lots of notation. And now everything is in place to get started with the finite difference method. The starting point for the finite difference method is of course our original boundary value problem where our goal was to find a function u such that negative u prime prime of x equals f of x for all x between the interval boundaries a and b. And then together with the Dirichlet boundary conditions u of a equal ga and u of b equal gb. The idea of the finite difference method is that we replace this original boundary value problem by a discrete boundary value problem. The right hand side f is then a discrete function from the space vh and also the unknown that we seek is an element of the discrete function space. And the derivatives in the differential equation are replaced by difference quotients which as we've already have remarked are in some sense discrete derivatives. So the discrete boundary value problem that we get in the end is searching for an, a vector uh from the space vh of discrete functions so to speak which satisfies the differential equation negative forward difference with step size h of the negative backward difference with step size h of uhk equals fhk where k is an index of an interior node k is between 1 and n and furthermore we've got uh naught equal ga and uh n plus 1 equal gb which are just the discrete analogs of the boundary conditions it is probably helpful to be more explicit here In some sense, we're looking for entries uh0, uh1, uh2, and then further and further up to uhn, uhn plus 1, such that for all k between 1 and n, we have got this discrete differential equation at index k, namely negative of the second order difference quotient uhk plus 1 minus 2 times uhk plus uhk minus 1 divided by h square equal fhk. And then we have got the discrete boundary conditions uh0 equals ga and uh m plus 1 equals gb. So if we take all these values uh0, uh1 up to uh m plus 1 and put them into a vector and call that vector uh then what we get is an element of vh, a discrete function, so to speak, that is defined at the nodal points of the discrete mesh. And these entries of the vector uh are approximations of the function u, are supposed to be approximations of the original solution u at the nodal points. So we've got several equations in n plus one variables indexed from 0 to n plus 1. And if we solve these equations for the unknowns uhk, then we hope that we get reasonable approximations to the solution u at the, those grid points. Which means u at the grid point xk is supposed to be approximated by uh index k. Okay, now we are left with a purely discrete problem Namely, we have several equations and we have got n plus 2 variables. How can we solve the system of equations? Now, we can easily notice that these equations, in fact, define a linear system of equations. Linear systems of equations is very good because then we are just in the domain of linear algebra. Okay, first we notice that the unknowns uh0 and uh m plus 1 are already known, which is, I think, quite obvious. uh0 is equal ga and uh m plus 1 is equal gb. And now all the other remaining equations 
involving the variables uh1, uh2, up to uhn, are in fact linear equations. So if we consider the equation that's associated with the grid point k, negative of the fraction uhk plus 1 minus 2 times uhk plus uhk minus 1 divided by h square equal fhk, then of course we notice that this is a linear equation in three variables. If we factor all everything out, what we get is negative h to the minus 2 times uhk plus 1 plus 2 times h to the negative 2 times uhk minus h to the negative 2 times uhk minus 1 equal fhk. So the variables uh0 and uh n plus 1 are already known. They equal ga and gb respectively. And so we are left with n equations and n unknowns. The equations are associated to the interior mesh nodes, to the interior nodal points, and the unknowns are precisely the values of uh at the interior nodal points, uh1, uh2, up to uhn. In other words, we can assemble a linear system of equations with n unknowns and n equations. Specifically, plugging in the values for uh0 and uhn plus 1, we get the equation negative h to the minus 2 times uh2 plus 2 times h to the negative 2 times uh1 equal fh plus h to the negative 2 times ga uh0. Then we have 2 times h to the negative 2 times uhn minus h to the negative 2 times uhn minus 1 equal fhn plus h to the negative 2 times uhn plus 1, which is gb. And then for all the indices k between 2 and n minus 1, we get negative h to the negative 2 times uhk plus 1 plus 2 times h to the negative 2 times uhk minus h to the negative 2 times uhk minus 1 equal fhk. The first two linear equations here are associated with the mesh points x1 and xn respectively and they look a bit different from the other ones because the boundary values are right next to them because they're influenced by the, by the boundary values at x0 and xn plus 1 respectively. As you know from linear algebra, often it's quite helpful to put a linear system of equations into a matrix form. So the computation problem that the final difference method for our boundary value problem boils down to is a huge linear system of equations with the following matrix in the following right-hand side. Let's take a look at the right-hand side first. Yeah, the right-hand side has n entries. The first one is fh1 minus h to the negative 2 times ga. The last one is fhn minus h to the negative 2 times gb. And all the ones in between are fh2, fh3, down to fhn minus 1. And then on the left hand side, we have got a matrix and a vector of unknowns. The vector of unknowns is very simple it's uh1, uh2, uh3, and so on, down to uhn minus 1 and uhn. So the values of the discrete function uh, so to say, at the interior nodes of the grid. And then the matrix has a special structure. It's an n times n matrix, of course, and it is tridiagonal. Usually it is written with the factor 1 over h square factored out. So we can write the matrix compactly as 1 over h square times the trigonal matrix, where the main diagonal 
as only the value two on its entries. And where the upper and lower diagonals have the value minus one on, in their entries. Okay, that's the linear system of equations. And then we can use techniques from numerical linear algebra to solve this linear system of equations. In fact, one can show that this system is actually solvable. The matrix is invertible. And so for any boundary values and any right inside F, we can always get a solution. Now to round up all this radical discussion. Let's consider the following boundary value problem. Over the interval from zero to one, we have the differential equation u prime prime of x equal exponential of x with the boundary values u at zero equal two and u at one equal three. For the finite difference method, we choose n equal five. So we've got five interior nodal points and the step size correspondingly will be one over six. Total, we're going to have n plus two nodal points. We have the boundary points x naught and x six and then the interior nodal points x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. The vector of h is defined as well, all the values of the function f, which is the exponential function, at the different nodal points. So the exponential of 0, exponential of 1 over 6, exponential of 2 over 6, up to exponential of one. Nothing very special. Finally, what we get is a linear system in five unknowns and with five equations. The matrix is one over 36 times the trial diagonal matrix with twos on the main diagonal and negative one on the sub and super diagonals. The vector of unknowns contains the variables uh1, uh2, uh3, uh4, and uh5. And the right hand side contains exponential of one over six minus one over 36 times one, exponential of two over six, exponential of three over six, exponential of four over six, and eventually exponential of 5 over 6 minus 1 over 36 times 3. And if you solve that linear system of equations, you get an approximation to the solution of the original boundary value problem at each of the nodal points. x naught, x1, up to x5, and x6.